Well, everyone, we can get started in just a minute. Hello everyone, welcome. This, this webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording and slides will be shared. Your phone line is muted. My name is Leslie Gabay Swanston, Director of Program and Systems Quality at the National Summer Learning Association. Welcome to our webinar on Reading Between the Lines, Building Equity Through SEL and Literacy. Before we get started, here's an overview of our discussion today. First, I'll share a little bit about NSLA for those who are unfamiliar before we hear from our expert panel. After that, we will wrap up with some announcements about upcoming web events, webinars, and how we will follow up on this particular topic area. The National Summer Learning Association is the only national nonprofit exclusively focused on addressing the achievement and opportunity gaps by increasing access to summer learning opportunities. NSLA's goal is to increase nationwide the number of high quality summer learning programs. To achieve this goal, NSLA recognizes and disseminates what works, offers expertise and support for programs and communities, and advocates for summer learning as a solution for equity and excellence in education. NSLA's work is driven by the belief that all children and youth deserve high quality summer learning experiences that will help them succeed in college, career, and life. Core to our work is the recognition that high quality summer learning programs work and have been shown to improve reading and math skills, school attachment, motivation, and relationships with adults and peers. We know that summer is a time of great inequity for young people, and we believe that promoting and supporting summer opportunities is a way to address this. This goes beyond the summer learning that's in our name. We also want to see programs and communities addressing access to other resources like meals and youth employment. Summer is a time for innovation and exploration. Without some of the constraints of the school year, kids are able to di try different ways of learning, interact with the other adults and peers that they might not otherwise. It is also a time for innovation for adults, whether that is opportunities for professional development, trying out new teaching methods, or exploring new partnerships. Today, we want to explore the way, ways to build equity through social emotional learning and literacy. I'm happy to welcome our first presenters from, from Scholastic Education, Pam Allen, Senior Vice President of Innovation and Development, and Dorothy Weintraub, Vice Pre President, Literacy Initiatives. Hi, everybody. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Oh, good. Um, well, thank you so much. Uh, this is Pam Allen, and uh, I appreciate everybody being on today together. We're uh, very, very happy to have this discussion. Um, I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about the work that we're doing at Scholastic Education. And in this moment uh, of summer, as summer comes, as begins to come and we think about the seasons of children's lives uh, and how important seasons are, no matter where we live and no matter what climate we're in um, and how painful it is to be in this moment where children have missed so much of their own learning seasons. So I, I, um, I'll take a few minutes uh, to share with you uh, some, some of the work that we're doing at Scholastic and also to think more broadly uh, in terms of what you all can be doing and what we're all thinking about together in terms of creating our learning seasons, even in the spite of these very profoundly challenging times that we're in right now. As we know, our children and our teenagers love, love to anticipate seasons of learning and whether it's starting school or coming into the summer, and what summer represents for them and what they, what they believe about what, what's going to happen for them. 
Um, so I, I'm going to share with you a little bit of the work um, that we've done to build on that idea of anticipating the season of learning that is summer. And we, uh, on behalf of all of Scholastic at Scholastic Education, we want you to know that we're here to support uh, after school programs, libraries, school districts, families, and of course the children themselves. This is me. I spend a lot of time thinking about summer. Um, I created a program with Scholastic and my colleagues at Lit Camp called, at Lit World called Lit Camp. And it's a summer learning program. I'm going to say a few words about that today, but I want to more broadly talk about what children have taught me and the teachers themselves have taught me and families as well, since Lit Camp really expands beyond the classroom and into the home. And, uh, and I've been very privileged to be side by side with children in their act of literacy discovery. I read many of the questions that you sent yesterday, and we really appreciate that. Um, we uh, think a lot about these things, as do you all, and I think two of the questions that really struck me uh, were questions around, uh, one, the access and equity part of literacy and the access and equity part of the internet technology that we're grappling with right now. Uh, we're very privileged to be on this Zoom call, even having access to a, a desktop or a laptop or a phone. Is, is a privilege and, uh, and, and I'm well aware in my work in districts from urban to rural to suburban to all across the country, the challenges people face uh, in terms of getting access, whether it's access to the hardware or getting access to the internet itself. So that was a big part of what you shared yesterday in your questions that, that many of you asked. And I will touch on that in the few minutes that, that I'll be speaking with you. Um, and then the second, part of what I heard you say is really what is literacy and what role does that play in the work of summer? Um, at Lit Camp, we've really uh, done a lot of work in thinking about our children as early literacy learners and then all the way up through high school. Uh, and I hold this piece close, a child who was five wrote uh, in one of our workshops at Lit Camp that the important thing about a child is that she is small. She likes pops, ice pops, and she plays after school. But the important thing about a child is that she is small. And I think summer is a lot about that, um, is about the idea of the vulnerability of our children, about how we can encircle them with safe space and safe community, how we can open, open the world for them and close gaps. And I think all of you on, the, on this call, uh, in this session, are people who want to close gaps and open worlds. And I think that is the work that we do in the work of summer is uh, closing, closing the literacy gap and the way we define literacy as reading, writing, speaking, and listening. Um, I would also include viewing, how children view the world, what they see when they look at a book, what they see when they look at the pictures, what they see when they look at a YouTube video. All of that is also, is also literacy. Um, and so the work that we do on this call and thinking moving forward is that at, we talk a lot at Scholastic about this idea of summer having a whole new story. And I think being right now in the times that we're in, our children are already experiencing some pretty profound slides and gaps. And I think we can tell a new story every day. I think this coming season gives us a chance to say, let's tell a new story. Our children may be confined in ways that we never could have imagined, but their imaginations are huge. Their spirits are huge. Let's not forget that within the mind of a child is a whole multiple worlds of opportunity, creativity, thought, and hope. And I always keep that close in these hard times, really thinking about the children that within the four walls of their homes, no matter the size of their place of living, they have huge opportunity to live into their imaginations. And I think that's what literacy really, really does is it helps children live in to their imaginations. So for summer at Lit Camp, we create a lot of spaces for that dreaming. Um, we can't do that this summer. Most of our districts are, are shut down. So we've been building a new program called Lit Camp at Home to help families and children and library systems and everybody together create a way of thinking about the space around summer as something that means something to every child in terms of literacy. That literacy is reading, writing, speaking, listening, viewing, and how can we make sure our children have access to that, that richness of literacy in the summer, and especially this summer, and especially without access to internet in the ways that we wish, that equity issue is just 
really, really troubling and hard. So I dream of the child. I think about the child. That's the center of my work. That's the center of the work that we do together as a community at Scholastic. And that work is about building worlds. And I think we can still do that. I know we can still do that. So our children are continuously hungry for learning. So let me define what I mean when I think about learning, when I think about the lenses for learning inside and outside of school for summer. So when I define summer, I'm thinking about the power of knowledge building, uh, the power of knowledge building and the power of sharing ideas and how we do that. And that's something that you all do in your work um, in summer and summer learning and summer school and summer library programs. You're thinking about how we build that knowledge and how we build those ideas in our children. The work of empathy building and connecting to others is a big part of literacy development, a big part of what happens or could happen and can happen in summer programming. The emerging joy of self-awareness as this child said, sent to me for a lit camp message, be brave, she said, be amazing. It's not just the, the work that we do for the children that we do with the children around that surrounds the children themselves, but it's also the work that we do and how they reach out, how they become from self to community to world. And I think that's something to think about uh, in this work that we do here is that when we create summer programming, we think about our children as learners, not to think about it just as what we're doing for them, but what are they doing for us? What are they doing for the world? Their voices are so important and their voices matter so much. So too, the power of stories, and I know you all know this and feel for it too, that as the power of stories as comfort, as freedom and joy. And that in our work at Scholastic at Lit Camp, we think a lot about that idea of story itself. And what are the stories children share? What are the stories that children make? What are the stories that children create? That reading is like breathing in and writing is like breathing out. And so that child under that desk is reading that story, but I also see it as the way he is shaping his world and shaping his voice. He's gaining comfort from that author. He's gaining freedom, but he's also gaining the joy of knowing he too is gonna to have a writer's voice. Now I know people are asking some questions and I hope perhaps uh, we can do that at the end because I, I, it's hard for me. I'm afraid to click on the chat and lose our slides. So I'm aware of the questions and hope that um, we'll be answering those. When I think about summer programming, I think about social emotional learning, academic skill building, and engagement with family and community and world. And I think we have a big opportunity this summer to do things differently. I think the COVID crisis makes us think, how are we only connecting to our children? Not only through academics in the summer, not only through the skills. I, I love skills, I'm a literacy educator, but also through social emotional learning, through the power of safe spaces, through the engagement that we can make with family, community, and the children out looking out at the world through their windows, looking out at the world through their imagination, those things can still happen no matter where they are this summer. So at, at Scholastic and Lit World, we created a model called the Seven Strengths, which I invite you to use. It's called the Seven Strengths because children themselves said to me, why is it that in school we're always told what we do wrong? We wanna know what, what do we do right? And so we built the strengths around that and we use the strengths to build a lot of our work in scholastic education and we build that framework to be used for children as they read. So they're not just reading for skills building, they're reading also for human learning and for human development and for social emotional engagement with others. The strength of belonging, the strength of confidence, of curiosity, of courage, friendship, hope and kindness, all of these are elements we see in the, in the text that we read. I'm gonna to come to a close in just a minute by giving us a few tactical pieces to take away. The seven strengths have given me a way to structure the work that I do around text, around literature, around summer programming. So first I think about belonging, how we create together a sense of well-being, of safety, of optimism through the creation of rituals around reading and storytelling that we create curiosity, that we don't give questions that we already know the answers to, but we ask our children, what are you wondering about? What feels hard right now? What makes you wanna change the world? We look at friendship through the lens of literacy, through academics, for making plans to read together in the future and if possible to stay in touch online and if not possible to say, hold your reading friend in your mind today. Through the strength of kindness, the families and schools together, your summer programs, leading with kindness, teaching with kindness, not only kindness to others, but kindness for yourselves. 
words of affirmation, appreciation, making sure parents know that's like the best thing they can do for their children. The strength of confidence, families and schools together building a culture of affirmation through text messaging, through, through emails, every step of the way to celebrate. If we can't celebrate virtually, then even, even in this moment of distance, creating summer programs where we're able to send the smallest of messages, even through the snail mail, any way we can to build that confidence in our children and our families too, that they value their family stories as we see encourage their own stories of resilience, of what it takes to walk the extra mile. Our families have incredible stories and I want children to know them. That's all part of literacy too. Their language, their culture, the ancestors, the elders, all of those things are such important strengths in a child to speak in one's own voice, to be real, to be authentic. All of that is courage. And again, I say reading is breathing in and writing is breathing out. And that's what we do in the work of summer is we can speak in our own true voice. And that's what I want our children to do. And then finally, I'll come to a close. Hope is us making plans together for the future, to have optimism in the future. Uh, we built Lick Camp at home at Scholastic to really create a sense of hopefulness that families can do together with schools and with your community-based organizations, with libraries, uh, with after-school programs, to keep that, that confidence going and that courage going. And now I want to turn it to my amazing colleague, Dorothy Weintraub, who creates so many, many safe spaces for children around the world and across our country uh, with literacy and literature, and especially in the summer when children need books in hand. So I'll turn it to you, Dorothy. Thank you, Pam. Hi, everyone. Um, hold on a second, just trying. Is it, Leslie, did it turn over? To me? I think it might have just turned to you, Dorothy. I'm hoping. Actual not, Dorothy. I'm clicking. Whoops. Ah. Hi, everybody. So first off, I want to say a big thank you to Pam Allen. As always, you know, she is just so inspirational from her words and from the wisdom that she gives us all. And every time she speaks, I'm always riveted by what she's saying. And the work that she has done through Lit World, her work at Scholastic, and of course, um, what you've just learned more about around Lit Camp. So I'm going to just uh, take just five minutes and really talk more around the additional um, literacy resources we have that are going to be for both online and offline that we've created for libraries, for schools, for families, and most importantly, um, some resources to kind of help you during um, this crisis. And like, I think mirroring what Pam just said that I think through these programs, we're going to find a way to like maybe open, you know, children's world through literacy and hopefully also close some gaps. I thought that was just, I had to copy that from Pam. So that, thank you so much for Pam. Thank you so much, Pam. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is our grab and go packs. Um, we actually created these as a result of what's been happening with schools and public libraries being closed. So these are prepackaged three and five book packs for grades pre-K to eighth grade. They include these activity sheets that are directly tied to the books. Um, there's an easy family guide that we've created to help families support reading with their children. Um, all of the books in the collections are culturally relevant. There's authentic text. They're going to be available. They're available in English and in Spanish. And the best part is that these books, these book packs um, can be shipped directly to home. So when we think about the have and the have nots, we feel like Scholastic Now um, has opened the doors to be able to ship directly into homes. And we think that for our children, without internet access at this point, it's critical that we get them these resources. So um, we've made this available. In addition to our grab and go packs, a number of you may already be familiar with our literacy partnerships and family community engagement programs. Um, we have an even wider selection of SEL books, culturally relevant and authentic textbooks, you know, from birth through high school in both English and Spanish. So if you haven't already had the opportunity to see some of um, our book collections and our please, you know, we can tell you a little bit more about it. Um, moving on, now when we start thinking about our, when we switch to virtual, 
I want to take you through three, two of these resources that are that Scholastic made available for free to help you, to help families. The first, if you um, may not already have heard a lot about, is Scholastic Learn at Home. Um, we've gotten a lot of really great press about it. Um, this website, uh, it's for kids, for children and families, well, families with children from pre-K to ninth grade. Uh, to nine years old, sorry. Um, this is a uh, free resource that we are including 20 days of learning experiences for three hours per day. I know it's a little bit rigorous going into summer, but prior to summer right now, we're making this available through June 30th. So the content in there, if you haven't already seen it, I really strongly encourage you to go in and look. It's got, in, it's got some really great um, programming around virtual field trips, projects, author interviews, um, and you sign, it's very easy to sign in. It's very easy to navigate. Um, and like I said, we're making it available until the end of June. And then dovetailing into summer, some of you may already be familiar with, this is gonna be our second year of doing the Rita Palooza. However, we've got, we've sort of changed the format a little bit. And instead of it just um, uh, reading and clocking in your minutes, we are actually launching a new and exciting uh, virtual program called Scholastic Home Base. So it's for kindergarten through eighth grade. Um, it's like I said, it's free. Um, kids are going to be able to read entire books. They're going to be able to interact with their favorite characters, such as Goosebumps or Captain Underpants. They can play book-based games and activities. It's all in a safe environment because Scholastic is monitoring it. Um, so there's nothing, you know, harmful that will come from that. Um, kids are going to be encouraged to track um, using reading streaks to earn rewards and unlock book donations as opposed to just minutes. We're really focusing more on the streaks because that will show us um, how many um, minutes they're actually um, in the chat, in the, in the community uh, and reading and interacting. And then um, based upon those streaks, what we are going to do is um, classic, like similar to last year, we're gonna donate up to 100,000 books uh, through our partnership with United Way Worldwide, and we're going to distribute those books to the neediest to the neediest communities. In addition to that, um, Scholastic is offering to uh, public li to librarians, to uh, educators, and to parents um, other additional resources that you may find very handy if you just go to scholastic.com/summer. And then finally. I want to talk about this one last resource. Given the, given the conditions we are in um, and the crisis we're under, we know that families and children and you as educators and as librarians are under a tremendous amount of stress to make this um, to help our kids, basically. So um, Scholastic, in partnership with the Yale Child Center for Child and Family Resilience and author Denise Daniels, RNMS, she is a leading child development expert and the creator of the Moodsters. We've announced the release of a free workbook addressing how to help families, educators, and children ages four to 10 cope basically during the coronavirus pandemic. This free workbook is available in English and in Spanish. And basically it's been designed to help alleviate stress and anxiety and include strategies to keep children connected amid social distancing. It provides caregivers and educators simple strategies to help children cope with their emotions. You can download the First Aid for Feelings workbook at, T at you see that website, as well as if, um, if you go to this classic Learn at Home uh, website as well, it's, it's embedded in there. So um, thank you for giving, giving us the opportunity to speak. And um, thank you, and I look forward to hearing from all of you and, and learning from you as well. So thank you. Back to you, Leslie. Thank you, Dorothy. Next, we're gonna hear from the team at Dallas Independent School District in, te in Texas, Lori Mandrigo, 
Man Lori Mandrum Griffin, Director of Extended Learning Opportunities, and Dr. Sharice, Sharisa Govan, Director of MTSS. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. This is Lori Griffin. Um, we just want to, number one, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to be a part of this collaborative. Also want to thank Leslie and the National Summer Learning Association for providing this platform to being able to share. Um, again, we're very fortunate. We have a board and an executive leadership team, as well as a culture of collaboration that allows us really, really to hone in because again, many of us are experiencing, you know, how are we going to handle uh, the COVID slide that you've heard about? Uh, in addition to that, how do we make sure that we keep students engaged, which I think was a lot of the questions, especially in, in virtual settings as well. I mean, so one of the things that we wanted to make sure that we did is address, number one, um, that there is a need that we all experience. This is an example. This is one program that we have. It's not, uh, we do have others as well. Um, we do have similar dynamics. Again, I am very fortunate and we are very fortunate to be with you. And so one of the things in extended learning, we provide year round programming, which encompasses both after school, summer school and summer programming. And so as a result, one of the things that we want to make sure that we include in all of that is what we call the E3 model, making sure that programming is engaging, enriching and empowering for students. Part of our contention is that during these times, uh, such as this and in the summer, we create memories and moments that literally can change the trajectory of a trajectory of a child's life. Um, being able to have those experiences, those exposures, um, and those models of what excellence looks like. And so one of the things that we want to do is to, at this time, share one of the models that we are working with. This is not the only model, but this is the model that um, we felt like it was important to share with you today. And so at this point, I will turn the presentation over to my collaborative uh, counterpart in this, Dr. Sharissa Govan. Hello, everybody. I'm trying to advance the slide. So it's going really quickly. Sorry about that. All right, so in Dallas ISD, we want to create a targeted experience for students focused on confidence, culture, and reading comprehension. So our summer program will target 1,200 students going into third, sixth, and ninth grade in the 2020-2021 school year. And as you can see on the screen, our goals are to increase fluency and we're going to measure that through um, an an, the MAP fluency assessment offered by NWEA. We want to increase comprehension, and that's going to be measured through pre and post assessments. And we want to increase positive self-perception rates of students, and we're going to do that with a survey that is given to them at the beginning of the program and at the end of the program. And our program is going to last from June 1st through June 18th. With our CAP summer program, um, we're going to provide every child with a hotspot. We're going to use Google Classrooms to post assignments and engagement tools for them to respond to tasks. And we're going to provide it, um, direct instruction support and foundational literacy skills through video conferencing. And we're being intentional about dedicating time to SEL practices and virtual field trips. Right here, you will see a glimpse of our day. So students will um, partake in breakfast at home. They are going to receive that morning message from our um, SEL team and then engage in a group activity. And then they will go into their workstations with that foundational skills um, teacher and our reading comprehension teacher. So this is what it will look like for our third graders. And on this slide, this is what the rotations will look like for our sixth graders. And our sixth and ninth graders will have an additional rotation where they will complete those independent work um, tasks on Google Classroom. An additional component that's not shown on this slide involves our STEAM backpacks. And so I will kick that off back to Lori so she can talk more about that. 
So one of the things that came up on some of the questions and one of the considerations and the questions that you guys posed are some of the questions that we pose to ourselves as well. Um, one is what do we do now we're fortunate enough and let me just be clear. This is one model. Um, so one of the things that we have are our virtual um, field trips. They also, some of them have lesson plans integrated in there. There's also a component as well that has SEL with different brain break activities. Please know that we will most definitely provide you the link to that. I know we've provided it to Leslie. Those are directly on our district website. And so as a result, you can access those. Please, please feel free to use them. There's really no reason to start from scratch on that. From the activity backpacks, one of the things that was very necessary is how do we create um, opportunities for kids because some of our kids, like some of yours, may uh, their parents may be working, they may be um, really, they, they, and again, we want them to have a semblance of summer. So one of the things that we did is we worked with one of our providers and created what we call um, activity backpacks, really focused around STEAM specifically. And we made sure that in that, anything that a child needed for a particular activity was already in there. In addition to it being in there, it also provides child-friendly lessons and directions because in some cases, we know that some of our children have parents that will definitely be there with them. We also know that in some cases, they may have younger siblings or they also may be engaging in this activity themselves. One of the things that we felt like was very important as well is providing kids an opportunity to post, uh, post their projects. So it's very much so project based. And I know I've said, you know, in terms of the incentives, sometimes the incentives for our kids is the acknowledgement and knowing that they, this is one of their accomplishments. This is a new experience that they wouldn't have been able to have um, outside of that. And so one of the things, again, with those resources is being able to provide everything that that child would need to be able to engage in those activities because we cannot make the assumption um, that those students will have what we consider everyday items readily available to them. And so that is what we're going to do in Dallas this summer to make As sure one that of our, our models. Are I know this information will be posted. Um, anything regarding virtual field trips. Um, I know I'm not sure if Wisconsin's on the line. We had um, a gentleman from Wisconsin contact us last week specifically. He was a business owner in regards to some of the activity backpacks just to be able to connect them with um, that particular provider that worked from that. Uh, experience. Like I said, this is one of our models. Anything that we can do to be supportive, um, we will definitely do that, as well as we look forward to the support that you guys will be providing us as well. Um, being able to share resources is the platform that we so appreciate, um, as well as the collaboration, because whether we're an urban district or a rural district, there's something to be learned from everyone. So we just appreciate you all um, for allowing and this is very valuable time in your very valuable day. So thank you. Hey, thank you. Yes, um, and we will be sharing um, all those links later as well as a link to the recording um, of this webinar and the slides. Um, next, we're going to hear from our panel representing libraries. Liz McChesney, Senior Advisor, Advising Consultant with Urban Libraries Council, Patty Reber, Youth Services Manager for Gwinnett County Public Library, and Sue Abramson, Children's Librarian of Wapaka Area Public Library. That I'll turn things over to Liz. Hi everyone, thanks so much for being here today with us and thank you Leslie and NSLA for hosting this important conversation. Um, we as libraries are really um, honored and excited to be represented here along with the Dallas Independent School District and our uh, friends and colleagues at Scholastic Publishing. Um, and I wanna thank all of you out there um, for your hard work and your tenacity and your grace and just your fierce commitment as we consider the specific needs of our kids in summer learning, this, this particularly challenging summer. Um, the Urban Libraries Council provides a forum for library leaders to share best practices and innovative ideas that support 21st century learning and help to activate democracy. 
um, the Urban Libraries Council is recognized for creating new frameworks that invigorate libraries and then their communities. Um, so in that spirit, ULC is in lockstep with NSLA and really leading the way in shifting the paradigm for summer outcomes in libraries for our kids. Um, and as we think through new ways to drive equity and, and process access, um, I think I, I recall Peter Drucker once said that the best way to predict the future is to create it. And libraries now is the time for us to rethink summer and to really recreate new ways to reach kids in, in, in new and meaningful ways um, so that, as Pam said, we can close gaps and open worlds. You're going to hear today from two library leaders, um, but first I'm going to start with what library, what summer used to look like. Um, it would look like, Leslie, can you go back a slide, please? It used to look like not very much social distancing, right? We considered summer learning in libraries to be social and kids together and collaborating in a variety of ways. Um, thank you, Leslie. But now we need it to look like something different for this next year. So what we're seeing across the country are online story times. You've seen them from almost every library in the country, readings and recordings, book clubs and STEM challenges online. Grab and go activities um, happen in front of libraries. We've heard of boxes being out in front of libraries with um, activities for kids to take and go. Phone and book reporting is being discussed, kind of the old dial a story model um, is coming back parental engagement resources, because we know those parents are tired out there. They're ad hoc teachers right now and thinking about summer learning um, is another wait for them. Um, so we're creating in our libraries curated resources for learning at home and kits that camps and summer providers can take uh, back to their sites if they're open. I've heard of some meet you in the parking lot um, ideas and Sue's going to talk about curbside checkout in Wisconsin and community wide goals. And with that, I'd like to turn it over uh, to my colleague Patty Reaver at the Gwinnett County Public Library. Patty. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, so here in Gwinnett, we're located in Georgia. We're right outside of Atlanta. We're part of the metro Atlanta area. Um, and so when uh, we needed to make the switch to a virtual summer reading, we were kind of in a good position. We've been using Beanstack to run our summer programs for the past four years. So most of our customers are used to tracking things online. But we decided that what we really needed to do was we needed to build out the engagement part of Beanstack rather than just having kids track the minutes they spend reading or track their books. Um, we use their ability to create challenges and, and we've used that in the past, but this year we've really built that out. We really want to give kids and teens and even adults some things to do during the summer to help build that community engagement that we're not able to do face to face. So what we've started doing is we have our regular permanent challenge badges that are just sort of that everybody can do at any time to earn points in the program. But then we are creating weekly badges that are tied to a theme. So there'll be a badge for babies and toddlers. There'll be a badge for kids. There'll be a badge for teens and a badge for adults that goes up once a week. And you can earn that badge for a week. And it's tied to like a theme, like the first week is fantasy. And then maybe the next week is uh, cartoons or graphic novels. And what it's going to be doing is it's linking to our Facebook or Instagram or TikTok. And there'll be a video introducing the theme and there'll be a place for people to comment and interact online. But then they can also do the activity, go in and either put in a code or say they did it or take a picture and put that in Beanstack. And then they earn points toward the program. So we want to keep people, we want to give people a reason to keep coming back and engaging and maybe kind of create some of that sense of community online within the comment sections and people being able to, to communicate that way. 
We're also going to be doing pop-up badges on our social media where they might be up for a day and it's it'll be things like take a picture of your pet reading a book and post it and then you can say you did that or take a picture of you reading outside just sort of things to to build that engagement. We've also are working with our uh, team together and we have a team of Spanish speakers that are going to be translating everything into Spanish and creating a Spanish program in Beanstack as well. So we'll have it in both Spanish and English. And what we are concerned about, like everyone I think is concerned about, is how do we reach people who aren't online or who don't have internet access? And I wish we had a great answer to that question. I don't think anybody does right now because it's the question I see everywhere. Um, what we are doing is we're really, really pushing that Beanstack has an app and that, um, that uh, you can access it through, through the app and hopefully more people have smartphones and have internet access. It also sort of depends on where we are service-wise in the summer. We do have a plan that if we are doing some sort of curbside pickup or letting small groups of people in the building, we will be giving out like paper versions that are a simplified version of summer reading. That just kind of depends on where we are uh, opening-wise. We're also working with our school systems. They have a bookmobile that goes around and gives away books during the school year. And this year they're going to have it operating during the summer. So it's going to set up at each school and they're going to have sort of books set up and kids can drive, their parents can drive them by, they can pick like two books and they get to take them home for free. So what we are doing is we're going to partner with them and have information about the summer reading program, the app, and hopefully uh, a um, paper version that they can take home and that'll be in the bag for the books uh, the kids get. And I think that is where we are. <laughs> okay. We're doing a lot, <laughs> but um, so um, we're also thinking about uh, ways to advertise our services uh, that aren't online. We're doing a big uh, push with a company called Mundo Hispanico to reach out to our Spanish population. And we're getting some banners that we can put out that's got information about uh, that summer reading is happening and that if nothing else, we have boosted all of our Wi-Fi into our parking lot so people can sit in our parking lots and access the internet. So we're going to have banners out on front of the buildings advertising that we do offer these services. All right. And <laughs> so that is where we are. <laughs> All right. Well, hi, everyone. I'm Sue Abrahamson. I'm from central Wisconsin, small town called Wapaka, about 6,000 people. Delighted to be here with you today. Um, we are moving from surviving to thriving, and that's what my staff's motto is for the week. We started our curbside delivery this week, as Liz mentioned, and it has uh, been its challenges. Uh, day three, I'm looking forward to going in as soon as this webinar is over. Um, but I've been pondering all the same questions you guys all shared when you registered for this webinar. And the thoughts I'm gonna share with you today are really about the things I'm gonna do in my small rural community of 6,000 people. But I think if you tweak them, they would translate very well to any community, including larger ones. So let's start off with um, switching the, completely how we're gonna do summer reading. We used to concentrate on the individual goals of summer reading and now, uh, we're saying, you know, we're in this together. We are Wapaka strong. So we are moving from that individual goal to a community goal where we promote helping each other out, where we promote staying curious as a group and feeding that growth mindset 
of each other. So the challenge for the summer in Wapaka is going to be how many books can Wapaka read before Labor Day? And so they were going to put up a big thermometer outside the library as a visual for everybody who drives down our main street. And we're no longer going to be seeking donations from our local businesses to fund these individual prizes because uh, all those people have supported us throughout the many years of summer reading. And uh, we've now transferred all of our in-person programming money from that budget to purchase uh, Chamber of Commerce gift cards for we that we can have weekly drawings for. So it's great payback to support our local economy, but also um, building the relevancy of why the library is an important anchor of our downtown. I agree, internet and book access is a real problem. And this is where uh, it's important for us to have that school public library partnership in place. So my school partners and I have been meeting weekly to better coordinate services during the pandemic, but now we're talking about summer. And we're we wanna be careful not to duplicate services. Um, with the parent-teacher group's help, uh, we're going to turn our, our individual prizes that we would normally uh, spend, give away at summer reading program into uh, paperbacks that we are putting in the 20 plus little free libraries around our community. And uh, we didn't realize how sparse these little free libraries were in the neighborhoods of children and families who need them the most. So that's been our challenge in the last month is trying to find homeowners and property managers that will allow us to put little free libraries in their neighborhoods on their property or in their laundromats. But that way access is available uh, to everybody and I, I know that with the right book in their hands they're going to read it and I'm very excited about that. And lastly, I want to say that uh, our school partners and I have been talking about that transitioning from uh, one grade to another, maybe it's even a, a new school. And that's really suddenly going to look very different for both the teachers and the students. So we are asking our teachers to fill out a short Google form of the things they wish incoming students had prior knowledge of and maybe even some fun things like their favorite uh, the teacher's favorite family movie or favorite picture book. And from this feedback from this Google form, we're going to create and circulate bundles that include the teacher's name and grade and a photograph of that teacher. And that will help the student get ready for the new school year whenever it starts. So those are just three great ideas from Central Wisconsin and I, I'm collecting them every day as, a, as I'm sure you are. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Sue, and thanks, Patty. Um, I'd also just like to say that uh, Sue and I are two of a team of eight members on the Association for Library Service to Children's Task Force for Summer Learning and Out-of-School Time Learning, and we would welcome the input of the nation's libraries. We're always better and stronger together as we develop national models to put before our ELSC leadership. Um, but please know that ALA and ELSC are walking in lockstep to help serve children across the country this summer and always. And with that, I'll turn it back to uh, Leslie. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we have about 10 minutes and I wanted to um, have some time on some of these great questions that we're seeing in the, the Q&A box. So we're going to try to get through as many as we can. Um, what you're seeing right now is a word doodle, I might be getting the name of this wrong, of some of the, the words that were included in the questions that you guys, that you all submitted when you are registering. Um, but we're going to take some of the questions now from the Q&A box. Um, but you can see that a lot of people have questions about Summer, obviously, but virtual learning access um, in the internet and children and being online. Um, so I'm going to try to get through as many of these questions as, as we can, the time that we have remaining. Um, but be sure, um, be rest assured that we will continue to try to answer some of these questions, um, both that you I see in the Q&A box and then also some that you um, submitted when you registered. So. Looking uh, back to our scholastic education uh, team, we have a question, a couple questions about the seven strengths. Uh, one person, Sheila, wanted to know if you have a bookmark with the seven strengths um, on it. I think she really liked those. 
um, and just where they can learn more about those. Oh, yes. Um, this is Pam. Thanks for your interest in them. We actually do have bookmarks at Scholastic. We also have uh, lots of amazing book collections around the seven strengths. And so we've created posters and also, of course, bookmarks. Um, but uh, we've because we've used the seven strengths to build so much of our summer programming, there are lots of really great ways that we've featured them. So if you'd like to come to our website at scholastic.com uh, backslash summer or backslash lit camp, uh, we can actually uh, point you in the right direction. Um, we also had a couple of more questions about the lit camp. Um, does it cover uh, middle grades as well? Yes, it, uh, we, lit camp goes from pre-K all the way through grade eight. And when we, when we host lit camp in person, every grade level actually has its own what we call bunk and it has its own 20 lessons and then matching books that go with it. And then if we're working with a library system or a community-based organization, <clears throat> people like to actually add in their own seven strengths books for independent reading, uh, what we call lit camp bunk time. But the program in person actually goes by grade level. Now for this summer, we've created a different version of lit camp called lit camp at home that is more by grade band. I know a couple of people asked about middle school in the notes. Um, we have a pre-K lit camp at home. We have a K-2 lit camp at home, a 3-5 and a 6-8. And each has recommended uh, books that are connected to those grade levels uh, and also um, many wonderful things to do, including some videos that we've created and our uh, guest authors from Scholastic reading aloud and, uh, and as well as lessons for teachers and librarians and other summer, uh, summer leaders and, and teachers. So um, we can, uh, if you, my, my, I'm really easy to reach on social media, Pam Allen, A-L-L-Y-N, and also uh, Dorothy and I at Scholastic, uh, we can always be reached uh, through Scholastic um, to, f to find out more about Lit Camp at home. Yeah, and we'll include that um, contact information in the follow-up email that will go out to all registrants um, after this. And one final question, will you extend the Scholastic Learn at Home from June, August, June through August as a resource for summer learning opportunities? Um, Dorothy, I don't think they're going to extend it. I think it's only going to be through June, but I'll get the official word in um, when everything gets sent out. I will, I'll get the final word on it, but I don't think it is going to be extended beyond June. Okay. Uh, we have a question for Dr. Govan. Um, could you speak more about your SEL practices? Sure. So last year, here, um, we did, this is our second year we're doing CAP. Last year, um, our SEL team, they met with students to go over breathing exercises, um, just mindfulness practices, um, to talk to them about, you know, what's going on in their life. So it's more of like a, a conversational thing with students and getting them to be mindful. Um, is that what you're looking for? Or is some, did you need me to expand on it a little bit more? Maybe it's a little bit more. So let me, and I'm sorry, this is uh, Lori. So let me just kind of tell you from the extended learning opportunities department and kind of feeding into, I you know Dr. Govan referenced what it looks like uh, specifically for CAP. But one of the things that we're fortunate to have in our district is um, we also have a Wallace grant that's around SEL. And so much of that work uh, is definitely happens on the teaching and learning side in terms of integrating that in to the curriculum, the content curriculum. I would say in the after school or the summer space specifically, um, we partner with um, the city as well as um, an amazing partner that we have with the Dallas City of Learning. And so we actually have pacing guides that correspond with literature um, and we engage the kids both in the brain breaks as well as you may have heard morning meetings. Um, of course, not in the morning, you know, in summer uh, or in after school, but being able to engage them in the morning meetings to talk about the, their, their feelings, kind of where they are before, uh, before beginning whatever that particular activity or even lesson is. And then going from there and really looking at that literacy piece. So one of the things that I would say is very great about the after school and the summer 
programming that takes place around SEL with our partners is because that pacing guide is there and it also has the books that are associated with it. It's very easy to pull out some of the key components um, and it is aligned to the work that's being done because we receive guidance not just by Wallace but also with Castle. Um, and so it's a great opportunity to be able to extend what happens during the year into the summer as well. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question for our library team. How can libraries offer online book sources while the summer will li still limit access to books in summer programming? Patty or Sue, you want to take that? Access to books. Uh, if you're fortunate to have an independent bookseller in your town, I have to make really good friends. They make great friends. Um, definitely Scholastic has some wonderful uh, pro, um, uh, programs available through uh, family engagement and that sort of thing. Um, I guess the, I'm, I'm not sure of the question. Could you repeat it again, Leslie? Yes, uh, it was about accessing um, access to books. Sorry, I can't find the question again exactly, but how to give, I think the question was about being able to get access to online resources maybe? Online, yes. Well, public libraries um, have a great resource through OverDrive nationally, but the, the trick with OverDrive is that they're inundated right now when there's not enough copies. And we're seeing lots of frustration with uh, people trying to find uh, what they want to read online. Um, and I think that's going to change as, as we get closer and closer. Um, as far as, um, you know, the public libraries are, are in my area anyway, are closed. They're, and we have made the decision not to have any in-person programming at all. So that whole idea of a youngster coming to browse is going to look very differently. And that's the thing that I'm concerned about. So we're doing a lot of virtual book displays. So we'll take our a group of books from our new shelf and make a nice little um, montage out of them and maybe do a short book talk um, online. But trying to, uh, it, is, it is a challenge and I think that every library needs to uh, use its resources wisely and effectively and, and it's going to look differently for everybody. Thank you. Um, so we are right at time, everyone. So I just want to close with a few uh, announcements. Uh, but first, thank you to all our speakers and everybody for attending today. Um, like I said, we'll continue to follow up with more information and more answers to your questions as we're, we head, get closer and closer to summer. Um, I want to remind you about some of the upcoming other upcoming webinars in our webinar, our Voices of Summer webinar series. Um, we're going to have some webinars on summer youth employment, um, exploring the impact of COVID-19 on uh, the future of summer learning, um, one on summer arts programs, and a couple on virtual learning, because uh, I know that those are really interesting, uh, hot topics that everybody's really interested in right now, so look out for announcements about those. Um, after, you've after this webinar closes, you'll get a brief survey um, so you can sign up for those other webinars as well to stay in contact with us. Um, and also, I want to put a reminder that we are still trying to have Summer Learning Week this, this year. It will be July 6th to the 11th, and this is just a really great time to celebrate summer and summer learning. Um, so we hope that you all will be able to participate. You can find out more information about that on our website. We are also still having our planning for our national conference. Uh, it will be November 16th through the 18th in Washington, D.C. Um, early bird registration is open until May 31st, um, so look out for more announcements about that as well. And if you aren't following us already on social media, that's the best place to keep in touch and hear the latest updates from us. Um, so here's all our, our handles on social media, so we hope that you'll follow us there as well. Again, thank you for joining us today. Thank you to all our presenters, um, and we hope to be in touch uh, as we continue into the summer. Thank you, everyone.